तुम और तुम आई थिंक यस सर वी कैन स्टार्ट नाउ नाउ ओके टू वन मिनट इज देयर आई थिंक ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वेलकम टू द थर्ड डे ऑफ वर्कशॉप टुडे फर्स्ट लेक्चर विल बी डिलीवर बाय प्रोफेसर बाला सुब्रमण्यम सो ही विल कंटिन्यू फ्रॉम स्टडी लेक्चर्स ओवर टू यू प्रोफेसर बाला सुब्रमण्यम थैंक यू या यू आर एबल टू सी माय स्क्रीन यस सर ओके फाइन ओके दैट्स व्हाट इज इट वी स्टडी वी डिफाइंड द मल्टीपल एवरेज and the multiple average essentially says that if you have a summation over b f of b b power it or something similar then only those bs for which h log b is small they will count and others will not count and therefore they can just be made to disappear from the integration and then we are giving two examples one of the examples i mean which i mentioned but i have forgotten to say it is more namely that in order to prove the one well, in order to prove the hardy's theorem that is between t and t plus t power 1/4 plus 2 epsilon that is a zero you have to do nothing i mean you have to get a upper bound for the corresponding function and with the modulus with the with the modulus of integral gt dt And the integral of modulus g t d t, and the integral of g t d t with the modulus etc. The lower bound is um, almost immediately clear from Ramachandra's result. As far as the integral mod g t d t is concerned, I can assume that it is non-negative, and therefore I can use multiple averaging. Only then the small range of n would come, and that range of n I can even take a trivial estimate if I don't do it. If I don't know what else to do, and that gives you t power one fourth. But what I forgot to mention is that for that part where h log b is small, where the n runs over a small interval i, it is not necessary to take a trivial estimate. You can actually use the uh, estimates on exponential sums, and if you use the estimate on exponential sums. then this can be made to 1/6 itself therefore you can actually prove by the same method by of course doing the estimation by the exponential sums that between t and t power 1 plus 6 plus say, t power 1 over 6 plus epsilon there is a zero and this 1 over 6 also can be improved and as i was explaining afterwards in the comment section i would assume that whenever you have a good bound for mu half then probably two times mu half is the length which up to which you should be able to go by the same argument but uh, i mean i have not worked out as far i don't know the details i do not expect any unexpected difficulties on the way but anyway the second application is an lower bound for the l2 norm and uh, ramachandra's lower bound for the l2 norm which is what i am trying to explain therefore i have a f of s equal to summation a n by n power s and i want to get a lower bound for f of uh, mod uh, l2 long of f of s on the line sigma equal to 0 therefore that's a aim to get a lower bound therefore you write the sigma a n by n power s as n less than or equal to m and n bigger than or equal to m plus 1 a n by n power s equal to a s plus b s and as explained yesterday before i will go this part a little fast because i have f of s and i of s are valid in sigma bigger than minus 1 and that is actually because i have already assuming that f of s has an analytic continuation to the right of minus 1 by whatever formula not definitely sigma a n by n power s that will not be convergent but by some other formula i am assuming that f of s has an analytic continuation in sigma bigger than minus 1 and for f of s is valid and a of s is anyway valid because it is just a dirichlet polynomial since a dirichlet polynomial it can be valid everywhere and therefore the bs is also valid bs is valid not as summation n bigger than or equal to m plus 1 a n by n power s because that will not be convergent but on the other hand bs can be valid precisely by defining it as f of s minus a of s 
then modulus of f of it whole square equal to modulus of a of it whole square plus modulus of b of it whole square plus two times the real part of a it bar times b of it and therefore when you want to get the lower bound t plus 3h t plus 6h then i can use the multiple averaging and therefore i can do the multiple averaging with the same integral t of 3 plus h to t of 6 plus h f of it whole square which is bigger than or equal to this f of it whole square is bigger than or equal to mod a it whole square which i am keeping but on the other hand b of it whole square i don't even know how to deal with but on the other hand unfortunately for me b of it whole square is a non-negative function and i am only interested in the lower bound since i am interested only in the lower bound and this b of it whole square is a non-negative function i can as well forget it and therefore the only thing which i will be left with is essentially the cross terms two times the multiple average of a of it bar times b of it ET. and the whole aim essentially is to prove that these cross terms are negligible this is where we stopped yesterday just we have to prove somehow these cross terms are negligible okay how do we prove if the cross terms are negligible as far as the main term is concerned the integrate is non negative and therefore i can as well make it as a single integral of course with a slightly smaller interval but anyway that doesn't really matter for us therefore if i start with the t plus 3h to t plus 6h i will get t plus 4h to t plus 5h but that doesn't matter but now that can be essentially done by this theorem of Montgomery and Vaughan, which I did explain, because the Montgomery and Vaughan gives you an L2 norm for any Dirichlet polynomial. Let's recall it. It says that if you have t plus 4h to t plus 3h, 5h, summation an by n power sigma plus it mod square dt is equal to summation to h plus o of little n, which is very important, mod i n square divided by n power 2 sigma. That is the Montgomery one theorem. And in this particular case, a little n is less than m. And m, uh, as you can remember, was chosen as to be h power 1 minus epsilon. And consequently, h plus little o, o of little n will uh, the o of little n will disappear. And then you get h into summation mod i n square. That's perfectly okay. And now the only point is to look at these cross terms. A I have T bar times B A T. Now you see B A T. I don't have much of an idea except that it is F of S minus A I F S, and therefore it does not have a Dirichlet series expansion. Once it doesn't have a Dirichlet series expansion, there is nothing which I, I know uh, how to do. Therefore, the, on the other hand, this means essentially I have to move the line of integration from sigma equal to 0 to some part, let's say sigma equal to 3, where B of S admits an Dirichlet series formulation. And once, because this B of S, which is defined by summation a n by n power s, n bigger than the m plus 1, and since I have already assumed my a n sort to be O of n power epsilon, this series is valid at sigma equal to 3. And therefore, if I can move it, then I expand. And as I was explaining yesterday, there are two problems in moving, and we will solve problems one, one by one. One problem is that in order to move it, what you need is an analytic function. But unfortunately, this AI of IT has a complex conjugation in it. And once you have a complex conjugation, normally you will not have an analytic function and you will have a problem. But fortunately for us, in this particular case, there is really an analytic function whose restriction gives you a of it bar. Since that restriction gives you a of it bar instead of a, a, I can as well take that function and then I can do that. And that's exactly what I am doing. Let it d of s equal to summation a n bar n power s. Remember again, as I explained yesterday, this n power uh, yes, appear, yes appears in the numerator, not in the denominator as a normal Dirichlet series will do. And once you have that, and if you restrict that function to it, and that is precisely a of it bar, and therefore consequently, this a of it bar can be replaced by d of it, and now the d is an analytic function, and b is also an analytic function, even though it is not given by a de uh, convergent Dirichlet series, and then I can move the line of integration. The one first problem that would come is that since the d of s is actually having s in the numerator, n power s in the numerator and not in the denominator, once you move to the right, the d of s will grow up. 
and therefore you may have some problems from the uh, horizontals. That is something which you have to handle. Therefore, let's do that first. Therefore, let G of S is not the integral T to T plus H, but just the multiple average. G of S is the multiple average of D of S into B S, which by definition is 1 over U power R from 0 to U, D U 1, 0 to U, D U 2, etc. 0 to U, D U R, D of S plus I U, B of S plus I U. So then the cross -print terms are precisely T plus 3H, T plus 6H, T power I T D T. And now what we will do is we prove G is small, move the line to sigma equal to 3, and at sigma equal to 3, we have already seen that the multiple averaging would kill it. Essentially, because the whole sum will go to the B2 part. The whole sum will go to the B2 part, essentially because your n is less than m, your m is bigger than m plus 1, and therefore your log mn will be at least as big as 1 over m, h log mn will be bigger than h over m, which is bigger than t power epsilon, and then multiple averaging will take care of it. Therefore, that's all what we are going to prove today. Namely, that we will prove G is small. And once G is small, then we are already G. And then for that, I need an L1 estimate for D of IT, B of IT. And uh, unfortunately, yesterday I wrote it as an L2 estimate, which was pointed out by Saurabh that it is an L1 estimate only where I'm having a not an L2 estimate. And uh, therefore, let me again repeat it. L1 estimate for D of IT, B of IT is equal to some integral model D, some um, modulus of d square plus modulus of b square about b i don't have any idea i you know only it is f minus a therefore it is mod d square plus mod f square plus mod a square dt and as far as the mod e, d square is concerned it is a directly polynomial and once you have a directly polynomial the l2 norm is always easy by the theorem of montgomery and one and therefore that will give you what you want mod a square is concerned that is also a directly polynomial and since it's a directly polynomial, again, I can use the theorem of Montgomery and one, and then I will get what I exactly want. And as far as mod FIT whole square is concerned, this is precisely what I am trying to prove that T T plus H F of IT whole square is rather big, as big as H into summation mod I L square. And therefore, to start with, I can assume that it is O of H into my mod I L square. And therefore, this is a L2 norm. And now let h of s be equal to d of s into b of s. Therefore, the cross term is precisely d plus 3h to t plus 6h, h of s ds. That is exactly the cross term. And now you see, if I am in the real part of s bigger than 1, where I can't write the b of s, then what happens is then I have summation a n bar by n power s that comes from the d of s summation a m by m power s that comes from the b of s and on the other hand the whole thing belongs to b2 because h log b is rather small and therefore that is small this is provided i am in a region of convergence of b but on the other hand if i am not in the region of convergence of b i cannot use this string but unfortunately what i need is the whole this estimate on real part of s equal to zero and the real part of s equal to zero is not in the region of convergence therefore what you do is I will just prove G of S is small so that I can move the line of integration and then be done with it. Therefore, let's write the G of S. G of S, as you may recall, is 0 to U, du 1, 0 to U, du R, H of S plus U. And that I write exactly what that means. And this is the estimation which I want to prove. The G of S is small. The G of S is summation mod i n square. And once G of S is small, then G of S can be moved to the real, real S equal to 3, and the proof would be complete. And to say that, therefore, we have to prove that G of S is small. I do the standard non-trunk, namely G of sigma naught plus it naught equal to integral G of W gamma W minus S naught ds, as usual. And I have put the gamma W. And if I have really interested in the integration between t plus 3h to t plus 6h, I actually take a rectangle which is t plus 2h to t plus 7h. This is the same trick which we are doing again and again because once you do it a little a bigger interval, then on L1 and L3 on the horizontals, then the S minus, w minus s naught would have a decent imaginary part. It will have way at least as big as H. And once it has a decent imaginary power, then gamma W has an exponential decay. And once it has an exponential decay, they can be forgotten. 
and as far as the L2 is concerned, again you are on the line 3. And on the line 3, then of course it is negligible because of multiple average. Therefore, the only L4 has to be done. And in L4, you write exactly what you want and then interchange the summation. Then you have integral over t plus 2h to t plus 7h, h of w dw. This is, this is on the line real part of w equal to 0. This is on the line real part of w equal to 0. And then you have the multiple integral. And then finally, you have a dur integral, which is gamma w minus s0 minus u d. And now you see the last dur integral is bounded. Therefore, I have already gained one u. Therefore, that is bounded. And therefore, in the multiple averaging, I have only r minus one integrals. Because the last integral, d gamma of w minus s0 minus u dur, that is bounded when you have u is equal to u1 plus u2 plus etc. u r. And therefore, I have only u power r minus 1, which comes. But that's a u power r in the denominator. Therefore, one u disappears. And then what I have is h of w dw and the real part of w equal to 0, which means what I need is t plus 2h, t plus 7h, h of it dt. I just need this is 1 over u times the L1 norm of h. That's all what it is. I mean, the whole calculation is not too difficult. So therefore, I have just skipped it. And now you see what is L1 norm of h. That's exactly what we proved earlier. H is T times B, remember. And that's exactly what I proved. The L1 norm of D times H into summation mod A and so on. And that's a U which comes as the denominator. And that will disappear. You will get only summation N not exceeding M, modulus of A and so on. And that's exactly what I got. And that completes the proof. The G is small, and therefore the proof is small. Now I will go to the next lecture. At this particular stage, in the multiple averaging or in this lower bound, if there are any comments, etc., I would like to finish them and then go to the next lecture. Are there any comments? I think so. There is no question yet, so we can continue. Now we'll continue. Therefore, I'll go to the next thing, which is called Ubiga results. Again, I don't know how many of you have seen the Ubiga word Ubiga results. Therefore, let me explain them. And the, for me, there'll be functions f of x, g of x, h of x. And these three functions will be positive, and there'll be monotonic will go to infinity. And then f of x will equal to g of x plus Ubiga of hx means limsup of modulus of fx minus gx divided by hx is positive. Equivalently, f of x is not equal to g of x plus little o of hx. Okay, definitely, probably for those of you who will see it for the first time, let me explain. You have an f of x. Okay, the simplest example, for example, is a psi of x. Psi of x is a summation lambda n, which is for all practical purposes, the sum of the primes p up to x counted with a weight logarithm of p. Okay, that is a psi of x. And the, for this psi of x, you need an approximation. x is the approximation to that. And therefore, you get psi of x equal to x plus any error term. Now, what you want to know is how, how best the error term you can get. And there are estimates which says that I can get a very good error term. And such estimates are called O results. And on the other hand, there are things which says that this error term cannot be very small. And that is what is called omega result, which means that f of x cannot be equal to g of x plus little o of h of x. This, uh, therefore, for this h of x, you cannot make it very small, is what it says. And then you have an omega plus, which means that f minus g is positively large. And then you have an omega minus, which means that f minus g sometimes can be negatively large. Okay. Therefore, this is what the omega results means. Omega results means that if you, you have an asymptotic formula, and then you want to say this asymptotic formula, the error terms sometimes 
or will be not necessarily always and in fact as you say suppose you have an omega plus and an omega minus because the error term sometimes becomes positively large and sometimes becomes negatively large that means essentially the error term becomes zero sometimes because from the positively large it has to go to the negatively large and at that particular point the asymptotic formula will be fantastic because the error term is in fact zero therefore we are not saying that the error term is always large we are only saying that the error terms can be sometimes long. Therefore, this only says that if you take f of x and asymptotic formula for f of x and the main term is g of x, therefore you have an f of x minus g of x, then this error f of x minus g of x can be sometimes as big as h of x. That's all what it says. Okay, that's how we got result that this error term f of x minus g of x can be sometimes as big as h of x and uh, what is there are actually two methods to do this omega results two different methods and one method depends upon the singularities of the generating function the second method depends upon the growth of the generating function Therefore, there are two methods. One is uh, depending upon the singularity, and one depending upon the growth. Therefore, now let me talk about the singularity part first. And the singularity part, the, the theorem is the theorem of Landau. I think the theorem of Landau is of something which I have already explained, and uh, still, still let me go through this once more. It's always nice to see. We already saw that that is. <coughs> Yeah, the, yeah, once you have a theory for power series, then there is a parallel theory for Dirichlet series. And in fact, that actually on the first lecture we saw that actually comes from the transformation Z going to E power S. And therefore, whatever the circles in the power series case would become vertical straight lines in the Dirichlet series case. And therefore, there will be a circle of convergence here, there, and here, here there will be an ups of convergence, a line of convergence, a vertical line of convergence. And there, in power series case, then inside the circle of convergence at every point it will converge, and outside the circle of convergence at no point it will converge. And similarly, in the Dirichlet series, to the left of the line of convergence, at every at no point it will converge, and to the right of the line of convergence, it will converge at every point. But again, I pointed out there are two major differences. Number one, the <laughs> circle of convergence is always the same as the circle of absolute convergence. Therefore, once you have a circle of convergence, since it's a circle, it will be absolutely convergent, which unfortunately is not true for the Dirichlet series. And we gave an example. And there are series where the circle, uh, line of convergence and the line of absolute convergence are different. And the second major thing is that in the case of a power series, there will be always a singularity on the circle of convergence, whereas in the case of the Dirichlet series, it is not necessary that there, uh, there's a singularity on the line of convergence. And we even gave an example, which is this alternating sum, 1 minus 1 over 2 power s plus 1 over 3 power s minus 1 over 4 power s plus 1 over 5 power s minus 1 over 6 power s, etc. And this series, the line of convergence is on the line sigma equal to 0. And uh, because, But on the other hand, this series is a pro, a zeta s times something, and the zeta s has no pole at all on the line sigma equal to 0. And therefore, this function does not have any similarity. Anyway, but on the other hand, Landau proved that suppose you have a Dirichlet series f of s equal to summation a n by n power s, where the coefficients are non negative, that's an extra condition that you need, coefficients are non negative, then f of s has a singularity on the line sigma a. On the line of convergence, it has a singularity. It has a singularity on the line of convergence. And in fact, much more you can say. You take the line of convergence and it intersects with the real line, then you get a point. Therefore, the point which is on the real line in the line of convergence, that point itself will be a singularity. Okay. What how does it help us? Okay, therefore, let's 
the i made one more comment also on the first lecture let me recall that comment and then i'll say a little more here that comment is because there is a line of convergence for general whether a and are non negative or not in general you had directly series f of s which is summation a n by n power s you want to know where, where, where is the line of convergence it is sufficient for you to restrict yourself to the real line at the real line you start from the right and keep on going to the, towards the left and see which point it is convergent at the very first time that from the it changes from the convergence to divergence that is the point and that's the line of convergence therefore it is not necessary to check whether at every complex point it is convergent or not because since there is a line of convergence and since you know that to the right of the line of convergence at every point it converges and to the left of the line of convergence at every point it does not converge and therefore consequently it is sufficient for you to restrict your attention to the line of uh, to the real line alone and once you have on the real line what happens then of course you can just go along the real line see where it, uh, at which point to the right of which point it converges and to the right of uh, to the left it diverges that particular point that is a line of convergence now the landau's theorem says a little more landau's theorem says that if you have a f of s which is summation a n by n power s where a n's are non negative and then if you want to know the line of convergence it is not even necessary for you to check at every point whether it converges and then go to the point you just check whether there's a singularity the the very minute you meet a singularity till that to the right of that it will be convergent that's exactly what the landau theorem says that you start from the right keep on going towards the real line on the real line start going and see where it meets a singularity and where it meets a singularity that is a point where to the right of, that is a line of convergence therefore you need not even check whether it is convergent at every point what all you have to check is whether it meets a singularity but now there is a variation of the theorem of landau and this variation is what i want to talk about and the variation of theorem of landau says let a of x equal is non negative and f of s is a function 10 to infinity a x y x power s ds i am putting 10 essentially because i just want to say that on the real line or somewhere close to the real line that may be poor some things like that they don't want but normally i will take 1 to infinity then and then this function f of s which is 10 to infinity a of x x power s also has a line of convergence with the same argument and once you have that line of convergence to the right it will be convergent to the left it will not be convergent and then on that line of convergence because a of x is non negative f of s has a singularity and in fact that singularity would be actually the point which is the point of intersection of the line of convergence and the real line therefore you have to go only to the and therefore for this f of s also if you want to know what is the line of convergence you start from the right all the real line keep going and you need not even check whether it, whether it is convergent at every point or not you have to only check whether it has a singularity and uh, you stop at the place where there is a singularity and that stops okay what do i do with that therefore let me give an application of this theorem let rho equal to beta plus i gamma be a zero of zeta of s beta bigger than or equal to half then psi of x minus x is omega of plus or minus x power beta minus x what it says therefore if there is a zero of zeta function somewhere then when you look at the psi of x which as i have already defined summation lambda n l not x in x which is the same as counting the primes with weight minus x is at least as big as x power beta plus epsilon and in fact sometimes it will be positively bigger than x power beta minus epsilon and sometimes it will be negatively bigger than x power beta minus epsilon and therefore even even under riemann hypothesis it will be actually x power half minus epsilon and of course much better results are known therefore i am not going to talk about the much better result i am only trying to give an idea but on the other hand if the riemann hypothesis is false for example the for example beta equal to 3 fourths plus i, I gamma there is a zero then you get actually a omega result which is much better which would say that psi of x minus x is as big as x power 3 fourths minus epsilon let's prove that 
Let us assume that it is not. Therefore, let us, for example, assume that psi of x minus x is always less than some constant times x power beta minus x. Therefore, I am assuming that psi of x minus x is always less than constant times x power beta minus epsilon. And then I take my x to be constant times x power beta minus epsilon minus psi of x plus x divided by x. Since I have assumed that psi of x minus x is always less than constant times x power beta minus epsilon, this psi of x is non-negative. That's what I have taken because I know that psi of x minus x is less than constant times x power beta minus epsilon. And therefore, this e i of x is non negative. And for this e i of x, I am going to uh, compute what is my f of s, which is 1 to infinity a x by x power s ds. And since a x has three terms, therefore, f of s will have three terms. The first term is f1 of s, which comes from the constant times x power beta minus epsilon by x power s plus 1. You see, the, that one has an x power s. And uh, my i of x has an x down. Since that has an x power s, and i of x has down, therefore it will give you x power s plus 1. And now this can be integrated. And f1 of s is constant times 1 over s minus beta plus epsilon. I am assuming s is rather large. The real part s is large. So that the integral is convergent. And then this is what Now let's look at f2 of s, which comes from the psi of x part. Therefore, it is psi of x by x power 1 plus x. And then I write what is psi of x. Psi of x is by definition summation and not exceeding x lambda n into dx by x power s plus 1. And then I can interchange the summation. I will get summation lambda n. And uh, all these interchanges, blah, blah, I can do essentially when, uh, yeah, when a real part of s is rather large. Then you have this. See, there is an inside summation n not exceeding x. And therefore, when I take it out, it will become x bigger than 1 which means that it is n to infinity dx by x power s plus 1, which I can integrate, which will give you 1 over s into summation lambda n by n power s. And summation lambda n by n power s, as we have seen in the very first lecture, is nothing but minus zeta prime s by zeta s. And therefore, my f2 of s is minus 1 over s into zeta prime s by zeta s. And now let's go to the f3 of s. f3 of s, the a of x part is just 1, and therefore that gives you dx by x power s. Okay, and therefore now what I have is therefore f1 of s minus f2 of s plus f3 of s. And now I want to know what is the line of convergence. In order to know what is the line of convergence, of course, as I was telling you, I start from the real point and then start moving, and then I, uh, then I try to see where the singularity is. Okay, this s minus beta plus epsilon has a singularity at beta minus epsilon. Okay, beta is the sum. But on the other hand, f2 of s minus 1 over s, zeta prime s by zeta s, has a singularity at s equal to 1. Because at s equal to 1, zeta prime by zeta s has a pole. Since it's at s equal to 1, zeta prime by zeta s has a pole, therefore f2 of s has a pole at s equal to 1. And f3 of s also has a pole at s equal to 1. And uh, therefore, theoretically, the pole at f, uh, f1 of s, namely beta minus epsilon, this pole being to the left of the pole at s equal to 1 should not normally count. But what happens here is something little interesting. I can actually now compute the residue at the, of the pole at s equal to 1 for f2 of s. You know how to do that. And you can also compute the residue of the pole at s equal to 1 for f3 of s. You know how to compute it. And then when you look at it, then they cancel. Okay, They would cancel, which means that this function does not have a pole at s equal to 1. Since it does not have a pole at s equal to 1, therefore, the first residue, the first singularity which it meets, the very first singularity which it meets is only at s is equal to beta minus epsilon. And therefore, beta minus epsilon has to be the line of convergence, because that is what Landau's theorem says. Landau's theorem says essentially that you start from the right and then keep on moving to the to the left and try to see where the first singularity arises. And that is what the line of convergence is. As we saw, the first singularity arises at s equal to 1. But on the other hand, there are two terms where the singularity at s equal to 1 arises. And the, the, that singularity cancels. 
and therefore there is no singularity at s equal to 1 since there is no singularity at s equal to 1 you still move further to the left and then you see the singularity at s equal to beta minus epsilon therefore consequently the line of convergence has to be to the right of beta minus epsilon which essentially means that this f of s which is f1 of s into f2 of s into f3 of s is a nice function to the right of beta minus epsilon but we have already assumed that beta plus i gamma is a zero of zeta s. If beta plus i gamma is a zero of zeta s, and this zero does not have any impact on f3 of s because it is all over s minus one, it does not have any zero effect on f1 of s because beta that because that part the f1 of s is regular because you have s minus beta plus epsilon. Therefore, when you put s is equal to beta plus i gamma, it's not going to have matter at all because there's an epsilon to save you. But regarding F2 of S, there's a zeta S in the denominator. F2 of S has a zeta S in the denominator and therefore it cannot be convergent there because F2 of S has a pole there. Therefore, beta minus epsilon can never be the line of convergence because then you will have a, you have a pole to the right of the line of convergence. And that proves it. That is the Landau's result. Therefore, you can get x power beta minus epsilon. How does the whole thing came? The whole thing came essentially because when you look at the generating function, the generating function zeta prime s by zeta s has a singularity on the point beta. Is that what I have assumed? And once you have a generating function, and this generating function has a singularity on the point beta, then the, there is an omega result which is beta minus epsilon. Particularly if the singularity is a complex singularity. Because if it is a real singularity, it will go as a second main term. Because you will compute the residues and so on and so forth. If it's a complex singularity, then it will give you actually an omega result. And omega minus is also easy, because now you have to construct an EIX. Omega minus means I have to prove not only the psi of x minus x is positively log, I have to prove the psi of x minus x is negatively log. Therefore, suppose psi of x minus x is not negatively log. Psi of x minus x is always bigger than, let's say, minus c times x power beta minus epsilon. If psi of x minus x is always bigger than c times beta x power beta minus epsilon, you construct an a of x, which is non-negative using that. Psi of x minus x plus c to x power beta minus epsilon by x. And this is non-negative, and I can. Okay, this is one method, namely that you take a function, you look at the singularities of the function, and then wherever there's a singularity, complex singularity, then that gives you an omega result. Even if it's a real singularity, it will give you omega result actually technically, but on the other hand, that omega probably can be done sometimes as a second main term and so on. Excuse me, sir. I just, just missed this one. Uh, sir, we have proved that uh, this uh, sigma is equal to beta is a uh, pole for this function. So how we are concluding from Landau's theorem, sir? Can you repeat it again? I just missed that. OK, because the Landau's theorem says that when you want to see the line of convergence, the line of convergence, what you have to do is you take the uh, real part to be something like a 30, 40, something like that. And then the real line, you move towards the left. See where you meet the first singularity. And that is your line of convergence. OK? That's what Rado Serum says, that you start somewhere, 30 or 5, a point in the right, start moving all the real line towards the left. See where you meet the first singularity. And that's exactly what I'm going to do for my function f of s, f1 of s minus f2 of s plus f3 of s. I start somewhere on the right at s equal to 30, starts moving, and see where I am going to meet the first singularity. And when I do that, then the first singularity which I meet is at s equal to 1. But the singularity at s equal to 1 mysteriously disappears because the, the s equal to 1 is a singularity for the function f2 of s as well as for the function f3 of s. And the residues cancel. Therefore, that mysteriously disappears. And then I move towards thing. Okay. Okay. I forgot to say something, which I will come in a minute. Uh, yeah, I should have probably said. When I start moving it, now this F3 of S 
has no more real singularity. Only the it has a singularity only at s equal to one. Therefore, f three of s will not give you trouble. Okay, and f four f four of s has a singularity only at beta minus epsilon. Okay, therefore, up to beta minus epsilon, it will not give you trouble. And now, uh, something I should have said. Thank God you remained. F two of s is concerned. It will also not have any singularity till zero because we know that the zeta function does not vanish on the real line. Okay, since we know that except at minus two, minus four, etc. Okay, and that is rather easy to see. To see that the zeta function does not vary from the real line, you what we did in the first lecture, you take the zeta function zeta s into one minus two over two power s. You take that gives you an alternating series one minus two power s. One minus one over two power s plus one over three power s minus one over four power s plus one over five power s etc. And then bracket them. One minus one over two power s as the first bracket. One minus three power s minus one over four power s as the second bracket. One over five power s minus one over six power s as the third bracket. And when the real part of s is positive, then each bracket each bracket is positive. Since each bracket is positive, it cannot vanish. And therefore, the zeta function does not vanish. And therefore, this f two of s is not giving any singularity. Once you cross the one, f two of s is not giving any singularity. F three of s is not giving any singularity. But f one of s has a singularity at beta minus epsilon. And therefore, when you go towards the left, the first singularity which you meet is beta minus epsilon. That, by definition, means That this f of s is valid to the right of beta minus epsilon. Good, because that is where you are. Because the Landau theorem says that you can go as much as you beat the first singularity, and the first singularity being at beta minus epsilon. Therefore, you can uh, you can go up to beta minus epsilon, which means the line of convergence has to be beta minus epsilon. But on the other hand, the line of convergence cannot be beta minus epsilon because To the, I have a point to the right of beta minus epsilon where f two f s has a pole, and therefore this f of s cannot be regular there because this point. Yeah, I can go up to beta minus epsilon. The line of convergence is beta minus epsilon, but to the right of beta minus epsilon, I have a point where the the function f of s is not regular, and therefore the beta minus epsilon cannot be the Right now, Pankaj. That's all what we are saying. It's okay. Yes, sir. That's perfectly fine, sir. Good. Thank you. This is exactly what would happen in every case. You have a symmetric function, and you have a main term, and you have an error term, and then you write an. Suppose the error term can be small, which means that the Then what you can do is uh, you write the error term minus the uh, symmetric function. I mean, then error term is small means essentially you construct your a of x like this. The error term is therefore this is non-negative because a of x minus x is always less than or equal to you uh, explore beta minus epsilon. You are assuming, and therefore once this is less than or equal to that, and this trick you can face in any case. Therefore the error term. Minus the symmetric function plus the main term. That's all what I have written. The error term minus the symmetric function plus the main term. And suppose you assume that the error term minus the symmetric function plus the main term is non-negative. Then you can use this theorem y x by x power s. And then there will be a when you do the same argument when there will be a pole. Okay, because the pole is what gives you the main term. Remember. But that pole for the symmetric function, as well as for the main term, will cancel. That's exactly what happened. Therefore, the symmetric function and the main term, the pole will cancel, and therefore that will not give you a problem. Then you move to the left, and therefore the first singularity is what will come from the error term. But on the other hand, there is a problem because there is a singularity. That's exactly what we are doing. Therefore, whenever you have a singularity, then you can get an error. Okay. Therefore, the, if if you have the first singularity, complex singularity is at the point beta. When you are moving towards the left, then if the first complex singularity is at the point beta, then you get an error term which is omega x power beta minus epsilon. Okay. 
That's exactly what it is. That is exactly the reason why we are not able to improve the error term in psi x minus x. We are not able to improve the error term in the prime number theorem unless you have a good zero free region. So you understand why you need a good zero free region in order to improve the error term because now this theorem says you that if you have a zero very close to one, of course there will be an omega term. There is no way you can even point improve the error term. Okay, but on the other hand, this is something which I plan to talk about tomorrow. That if you are not interested in psi of x, which is summation n not exceeding x, but you are interested in the short sum estimate x to x plus h lambda n. Therefore, which is psi of x plus h minus psi of x. If you have a short interval results, then this the contribution from that uh, from the zero seems to somehow cancel, and therefore that does not give you problem. Therefore, for short intervals, you won't get such a good error terms. Is it okay, Sarab? Okay. Yes, sir. Not too completely fine, sir. No, that's a second method. The second method is the growth of the function. Suppose you have a function which grows rather fast, okay? Then you can get an omega result, okay? Which is what exactly what I want to explain. That if you have a growth of a function, then you can get an omega result. In order to do that, let me define a certain transforms, and I am not very sure as far as the constants are concerned, I have write, written them correctly because I always have this difficulty in when you're writing the Fourier transform without a thing to put the correct constant. But anyway, therefore, that is, so therefore you have a Fourier transform, which is f hat t is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity f of x e power minus ax t d x. And then you have an inverse Fourier transform, which is f of x equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral f hat t e power i x t d t. And then you have a Planchard formula or Parseval formula, which is minus infinity to plus infinity mod f of x whole square equal to 1 over 2 pi integral mod f hat u whole square. This is something which you all of you know, because the Fourier transform is something which you have seen left and right. But in the number theory, we also need one more transform, which is called a Mellin transform. Okay, and the Mellin transform is what we have used. Therefore, the Mellin transform is defined by if f of x equal to 0 to infinity f of x x power s minus 1 dx, that is the so called Mellin transform, f of x equal to integral 0 to infinity f of x e by x power s minus 1 dx. And then there's an inverse Mellin transform. The inverse Mellin transform is Bogart. That's a 1 over 2 pi i missing. Whenever you write an integral complex integral, you have to, you are supposed to put a 1 over 2 pi i in the front, which I have somehow forgotten. f of x equal to 1 over 2 pi i into c by the psi infinity to c plus i infinity f of s x power s minus 1 dx. This is an inverse Mellin transform. Therefore, you have a Mellin transform, which is f of x equal to 0 to infinity f of x x y x minus 1 dx. And then you have the inverse Mellin transform, which is little f of x equal to c minus i to c plus i infinity f of x x y x minus. And this in Mellin transform and inverse Mellin transform, you would have seen many times, probably with the concrete examples. And then let me recall for you one concrete example where you, have, you would have seen it. And for example, if you take a little f of x equal to e power minus x, then you have 0 to infinity e power minus x, x power s minus 1 dx is by definition. Therefore, the Mellin transform of e power minus x is the gamma function. And then when you do the inverse Mellin transform, 1 over 2 pi i c minus infinity c plus i infinity gamma s x power minus s ds, you will get e power minus 6. Okay. Therefore, this is a Mellin transform. and. Uh, Inverse Mellin transform, and then I want to know whether there is something called a Planchard formula or Parseval's formula for in this case of a Mellin transform. Because we for the Fourier transform, we had it. We had a Fourier transform, there's a formula which connects F and F hat. And if it's similarly exactly, we want to know whether there is a similar formula for the Mellin transform which connects capital F and F. And that is this formula here. It's zero to infinity modulus f of x whole square to dx by x equal to 1 over 2 pi i to integral minus infinity to plus infinity modulus f of i t whole square. Therefore, in the left hand side, what you have, in the left hand side, what you have is this function, and in the right hand side, what you have is a Mellin transform. Okay. First of all, let me give you a one line proof of it, and then probably I would explain what this one line proof is. 
The one line proof of this theorem, integral zero to infinity mod fx squared by x dx equal to one over two pi i, integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of i t whole square dt. The one line proof is, define the function g of s, g of u to be f of e power u. And once you define the function f of g of u equal to f of e power u, then your LHS is the L2 norm of g by Fourier transform. That is the same as the L2 norm of g hat and the L2 norm of g hat is RHS. Okay. Therefore, sorry, I am not giving an independent proof of it. I am just using already what I know in the Fourier transforms and just I am using it. Okay. Theoretically, I should have given an independent proof, but that's okay. Therefore, let me just prove that, that this LHS is the L2 norm of GU and the RHS is the L2 norm of G hat. Once I have this, then this is. Now, therefore, let's take the L2 norm of G. When you take the L2 norm of G, which is minus infinity plus infinity mod G U whole square D U, and G U by definition is F of E power U, therefore you put G U equal to F of E power U, therefore you get minus infinity plus infinity F of E power U mod square D U, and make an obvious change of variable of E power U going to X. And once you make an obvious change of variable of e power u going to x, then this minus infinity plus infinity modulus of f of e power u mod square du becomes actually zero to infinity modulus of f of x whole square times dx by x. And that is exactly the left hand side. Therefore, the left hand side is just nothing but the L2 norm of g. And now I have to prove that the right hand side is just the L2 norm of g hat u. And therefore, first of all, I should know what g hat u is, and then I should take the L2 norm. Take g hat u y, g hat y by definition is integral g u e power minus i y u d u, and g u is by definition f of e power u. Therefore, g u is g hat y is integral f of e power u e power minus i u d u, and you obviously make a change of variable e power u equal to lambda. Then you get once you make a change of variable e power u equal to lambda, this is f of lambda lambda power minus i y d l lambda by lambda. And that is by definition the full uh, uh, Melly transform f of i y, and therefore your g hat y is f of i y, and that's exactly what my right hand side is. Okay, f of i y i to uh, one over two pi i minus oh that's not one over two pi i. There should not be an i at all. Okay, this is like a real numbers. One over two pi into minus infinity plus infinity f of i t whole square. I mean. As I told you, I might have been goofing in the normalization factors, but everything will actually come to, to exactly what you want. The only thing which I want to make a point is the so we, we have always this Perron's formula. This Perron's formula is suppose you have again, let's take the psi of x itself, and therefore I am interested in psi of x. And it's a generating function of psi of x is minus zeta prime x by zeta s. And I normally do the psi of x by using Perron's formula for minus zeta prime x by zeta s. Then it will be my integral minus zeta prime by zeta s x power s by ds. Okay. But on the other hand, in this building transform here, I have written x power minus s. Therefore, there's a, some problem of x going to minus one over x business. Because if this x can go to one over x, then it's okay. But fortunately, when you look at this theorem, this kernel dx by x is a kernel which is invariant for in x going to 1 over x. If x goes to 1 over x, the kernel dx, the, the, the differential dx by x remains the same. And therefore, whether I have an x power minus s there or x power plus s there, it doesn't really much matter. Therefore, whatever the theorem which I have proved with the x power minus s, I can also get with the x power s by replacing x by 1 over x because the, the, the differential dx by x is invariant under x going to 1 over x. That's exactly the point which I want to say. Therefore, this result is true even for fs into x power s by s ds. Because instead of x power minus s, I can put x power s because this, this differential is invariant. And now let's look at the Perron's formula. What is Perron's formula? Perron's formula is something which I discussed in the very first lecture. Okay, let Fs be any Dirichlet series. If you take any Dirichlet series F of S equal to summation A n by n power S, and let us assume that this Dirichlet series is absolutely convergent at sigma bigger than one. And then I want to write the main term. Okay, and uh, I am now saying that, for example, 
I move, I, I cross more, I, I get the main term more or less by crossing all the poles. Okay, because I have my integral from C minus I infinity to C plus I infinity and I move towards the left. And if there are poles, I cross the poles and that gives you the residue, that gives you the main term and then I go to the left. For example, let's say if there are three poles. Normally there will be only one pole at s equal to one. But it's generally let's say three poles. And then you move to, a, you cross all the three poles that gives you the main term. And then of course I have moved to beta and that gives you the main term. And therefore, and then I integrate over beta and that gives you the error term. That's exactly what we do normally in the Perron's formula. In Perron's formula, you start with an integral, which is C minus i t to C plus i 1 over 2 pi i, C minus i infinity to C plus i infinity, f of s, x power s, ds. And then you, once you have an idea about the poles, you sort of cross the poles. And once you cross the poles towards the left, you get at every pole, you get the main term coming from the residues. And then afterwards, then you stop there, and that gives you the error term. The integral on the left side gives you the error term. Therefore, the integral will be E x equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral over that line beta f of s x power s pi s. This is the standard Perron's formula. Therefore, let me again repeat. You start with the 1 over 2 pi i integral f of s x power s pi s ds on a line c, where c is to the right of 1, or whatever it is. And then you start moving towards the left, and cross the poles, and then stop anywhere, and that gives you the error. OK, that means essentially the E of x is the Mellin transform of f of s by s. OK, that's exactly what you said, because there should have been x power minus s, but we, asked, we saw already that x power minus s and x power s makes no difference. Essentially, whatever I do, I have done for x power minus s, I can do it as x power s. And then, and the same argument, when you argue a little more carefully, gives you that E x over x power alpha is a Mellin transform of f of alpha plus i t by alpha plus i t. Therefore, we, that's so exactly what the Perron's formula tells you. Perron's formula tells you that E x over x power alpha is a Mellin transform of f of alpha plus i t by alpha plus i t. Once you know that this is a Mellin transform, then I can use this theorem. Because this theorem gives you an L2 norm over the function in terms of the L2 norm of the Mellin transform. And that's exactly what I am going to do. Therefore, the L2 norm of this function is the L2 norm of the Mellin transform. And therefore, that gives you 0 to infinity mod Ex squared by x power 1 plus 2 alpha dx equal to integral minus infinity to plus infinity modulus of f of alpha plus it whole square divided by alpha plus it whole square. That is the formula which you want. This formula comes essentially from the Mellin transform. To, to ab just observing the fact that E x over x power alpha is a Mellin transform of f of alpha plus it by alpha plus it by definition from Perron's formula. And then you just use the Placharel or Parseval for the Mellin transforms. And then you get this zero to infinity mod e x squared by x power two plus two alpha d f equal to minus infinity to plus infinity mod f of alpha plus i t whole square alpha plus i t whole square. Now what do I do? How do I use it? Now let's see. We have already seen the new sigma for the zeta function. Let us assume, for example, the law of hypothesis. Lindelof hypothesis says that mu sigma equal to zero when sigma is bigger than half, and mu sigma equal to half minus sigma when sigma is less than zero. Then sigma is less than half. That's exactly Lindelof hypothesis. Mu sigma equal to zero when sigma is bigger than half, and mu sigma equal to half minus sigma when sigma is less than half. Which essentially means that this mu sigma increases to infinity as you move towards the left. Okay, up to half it remains zero and then it becomes half minus sigma and therefore that goes actually as the sigma goes to minus infinity, therefore the half minus sigma goes to plus infinity. And this is typical not only for the zeta function, but for every function, practically every Dirichlet series. Every Dirichlet series, the growth will keep, in, once you move towards the left, the growth will keep increasing. Therefore, what do I do now? I go up to a point alpha where the right hand side diverges. 
I go up to a point alpha where the right hand side diverges, which means essentially what I need. I need my uh, capital F of alpha plus it should be roughly bigger than square root of t. If capital F of alpha plus it is roughly bigger than square root of t, because the denominator alpha plus it whole square is just a t square, and if f of alpha plus it is bigger than square root of t, then its a square is t, denominator is t square, and therefore there will be a t in the denominator. Once there is a t in the denominator, therefore the right hand side is divergent. I choose that alpha where the right hand side is divergent, and therefore the left hand side also has to be infinity. And since the left hand side also has to infinity, then it clear then this e of x cannot be o of x power alpha minus epsilon. Because if e of x is o of x power alpha minus epsilon, then mod e x squared by x power 1 plus 2 alpha is of the order 1 over x power 1 plus 2 epsilon, and 1 over x power 1 plus 2 epsilon is convergent. Therefore, the e of x has to be. Okay, since there are alphas for which the capital F of alpha plus it is big as big as square root of t, therefore the e of x has to be o of x power alpha minus x. Well, I have written o of x, omega of x power alpha, but I should have written omega of x power alpha minus x. It's okay. That's exactly. That's therefore the growth of the function f gives you an omega result. The f grows. The fact that the f grows when you move towards the left gives you an omega result. Therefore, let me again give one application of it first. This is what we have proved just now. Ah, the application which I want to give is for the symmetry function of dn. The symmetry function of dn, let us call it Sx. And then let us assume that I, can, I want to get an omega result for summation dn. And I write the growth. Summation dn by n power s is equal to zeta square s. And you see, there is no singularity at, for zeta square s at a, except at s equal to 1. And s equal to 1 gives you the main term, whatever it is. Which means I cannot use Landau's theorem at all. Because I start with a function which has no singularity. Since a function has no singularity at all, there is no way I can use the Landau theorem. Therefore, if I want to get an omega result, Landau theorem is completely useless for this particular function. Therefore, what I need is some other things, and then I use this. Therefore, I have seen what? Yeah, what's that I have seen? I have seen whenever you have the generating function f of alpha plus it. And the generating function is bigger. If you choose an alpha in such a way that this generating function is bigger than square root of t, then that for that alpha you get an omega result. That's practically the take home. The take home is you choose your alpha such that your generating function f of alpha plus it is bigger than square root of t. And then for that alpha, omega e of x is omega for alpha minus epsilon because. Again, let me again repeat, since f of alpha plus it is bigger than equal to square root of t, therefore the right hand side integral is divergent and therefore the left hand side integral is divergent and therefore consequently e of x has to be big. e of x is small, then the left hand side integral will not be divergent. Now let's do the zeta square s. What do I need? I need an alpha where this particular such that this particular function is bigger than square root of t. That's all what I need. This function is bigger than square root of t. Therefore, f of alpha plus it is zeta square one fourth plus it. Ah, and uh, bigger than square root of t, essentially only in the L2 norm, not even in the L infinite norm. It will be L infinite norm, forget it. In the L2 norm, it should be bigger than square root of t. Now, now for zeta square one fourth plus it, I can use the functional equation. Once I wrote functional equation, then it will give you something like a t power half times zeta square 3 fourth plus it. By Ramchandra's theorem, zeta square 3 fourth plus it is bigger than 1 in L2 norm. Okay? Because he has already proved that it's bigger than 1 in L2 norm, which means your f of alpha 1 fourth plus it is bigger than square root of t. Therefore, alpha equal to 1 fourth is precisely what you are taking. You take alpha equal to 1 fourth. Therefore, the right hand side is bigger than zeta square 3 fourth plus it divided by t, and that is 
by Ram Sundar Sera, that is the, the set of three fourth society is bigger and bigger than one in L2 norm. Therefore, the RHS is infinity, and the consequently LHS is equal to infinity, and therefore E of x is O of x power 0.25 minus epsilon. It's, it is impossible for E of x to be bigger than x power 0.25. And in this particular case, I should probably make a comment. One can more or less improve this argument, which I think Ramsundra has done, going up to x power 0.25. But on the other hand, x power 0.25 is not the best. The best is, I think, x power 0.25 times the logarithm of x power 1 fourth into some exponential of constant times square root of log log x. All smaller factors will come. And that case, that will not come from this many transform things at all. It has to be then, if you want a final estimate, putting all those logarithm factors and things like that, then you have to argue a little differently. And uh, if I remember correct, the best results in this direction is due to Sagar Rajan, who seem to have got not only the best possible power of log x, but probably also what is expected to be the best possible power of log log x also. And those things, therefore, those final estimates will not come from this. Okay, this will give essentially the order. Okay, if you find point two five is the correct order, you can get the point two five, and that's all. The extra logarithm etc. will not come from this L two estimate. And in fact, once I was talking to Selma, who told me that probably you won't even expect that because you are only using the L two norm and the L two norm level probably. Those final estimates might not be even true. Okay. Up to this, what I have done is classical. Okay, there's no Ram Sandra to what I have done. Now comes the Ram Sandra. Now, what is Ram Sandra? Ram Sandra considered the following example. In fact, he considered a one more complicated example, which I will come later. He considered this example zeta 2 years into zeta 3 years by divided zeta 6x. And this example, zeta 2 years into zeta 3 years by zeta 6x, the summation an by n power s, that an equal to 1 if p divides n implies p squared divides n and 0 minus this. Else. This essentially means that if the n does not have any prime appearing to the first power, then an equal to 1. And uh, if an has any prime appearing to the first power, then an would be zero. And these numbers are called what square full numbers. Square full numbers are precisely those numbers where every exponent is bigger than or equal to two. Again, I can do the same argument. EF is whole square by x power 1 plus 2 alpha d is equal to integral minus infinity plus infinity f of alpha plus it whole square alpha plus it. And what I am only interested in knowing is which is the alpha for which f of s is bigger than square root of t roughly. Okay. Now I am taking alpha equal to 1 over 10. When you take alpha equal to 1 over 10, then you have a zeta of 2 alpha plus 2 it, which gives you something like a mod t power half minus 2 alpha as the order. Because that's exactly what the what your functional equation will tell you. Functional equation will tell you that zeta of sigma plus i t is t power half minus sigma into t power one uh, into zeta function at one minus sigma plus i t. And this one minus sigma plus i t towards the right, I just need that it is L2 norm is bigger than one, which is essentially intuited by Ramchandra, and therefore that's not the problem at all. What I need is what is the power of t that comes. Therefore, zeta of two alpha plus two i t will be something like a t power half minus two alpha. Zeta of 3 pro alpha plus 3 it is something like a t power half minus 3 alpha. And therefore, consequently, and zeta 6x, let's forget it. Okay, uh, the reason why I'm going to forget it, I'll take uh, later. F of alpha plus it is bigger than t power half minus 2 alpha and f minus 3 alpha, which is t power 1 minus phi alpha. By definition, alpha equal to 1 over 10. Therefore, this 1 minus phi alpha is equal to half, and that's exactly what I'm going to and therefore, you get a omega result with alpha equal to 1 over 10. Now, the question is to make it rigorous. This argument, we make it rigorous. Okay. Where, where is the problem in making this argument rigorous? The more problem in making the argument is rigorous is that, that when you move the line of integration to any point which I want, 
I am assuming that there is the function is analytic. Okay, only then I can move the line of integration, and therefore when I go, therefore this is assumption which I am always making. Yes. Yeah. Therefore, the theorem when I write mod e x square by x power one plus two alpha d s equal to mod of alpha alpha plus i t whole square by mod alpha plus i t whole square. I am assuming that this function capital F is analytic to the right of alpha because I have moved it to the right of alpha, except for the force about which I know which contribute the main term. Okay, that is the basic assumption. The basic assumption in this theorem is that zero to infinity mod e x square by x power one plus two alpha d s. The basic assumption is that this capital F, which is a generating function, is analytic up to the right of alpha, or preferably right of alpha minus epsilon, except for the poles about which I have a knowledge and the poles which contribute to the right. Is that true here? I want to move it to one over ten. I want to move it to one over ten. Once I want to move it to one over ten, then I would like to know whether this function f of s equal to zeta two s, zeta three s by zeta six x is analytic to the right of one over ten, except for the poles which I do. The poles are very clear. At s is equal to one over two, there is a pole coming from zeta s, and at s equal to one over three, there is a pole coming from one over three, and Uh, the zeta two s and zeta three s have no other pole. But what about the denominator? Zeta six s. Zeta six s theoretically can have poles with the neighborhood of one over six. Okay, because we don't know any good zero free region. Our zero free region is uh, not even beyond uh, one minus epsilon. Okay, therefore zeta six s can theoretically have zeros to the uh, To the right, to the place around one over twelve. Okay, one over zeta six x. Well, this is some slightly complicated. Let me again go through slowly. Probably, I am not sure whether all of you are tired by now. Zeta six x can have poles. Zeta six x can have zeros to the right of one over twelve minus epsilon. Okay, because zeta function. Can have zeros to the right of one minus epsilon. Since zero, therefore it okay, it can have poles. Oh, okay, which means that essentially I cannot move up to alpha equal to one over ten unless I assume something like a Riemann hypothesis. If a Riemann hypothesis means I can go even up to one over twelve, and therefore one over ten going is no problem. But other than if I don't assume Riemann hypothesis, then crossing one over six itself is difficult. At one over six minus epsilon, there can be a zero. But I want to go all the way up to one over ten, and going all the way up to one over ten is not allowed because I don't know the zero region for one over zeta six s. And therefore, this method cannot be made rigorous. This method cannot be made rigorous. This growth thing cannot be made rigorous for the simple reason that this function capital F of s is not necessarily analytic to the right of one over ten, except for the poles which we know. They believe the poles at one over two and one over three. Therefore, I cannot prove that I am getting it. But the situation theoretically is not bad. Yeah, that's the question which you are asking. Is it true that f of s is analytic in sigma bigger than one over ten, except at one over two and one over three? There are probably some some via media you can do. Let's do some via media. There are two cases which you can discuss. The one case is that zeta six s has no complex zeros to the right of one over ten. Suppose you assume that zeta six s has no complex zeros to the right of one over ten, then you have no problem. You can move, you can move and use this idea, and then you can get an omega result. Okay, because I am assuming that there are no complex zeros to the right of one over ten. But what happens if there are complex zeros to the right of one over ten? If there are complex zeros to the right of one over ten, then go back to Lando. I already have a zero to the right of one over ten, and therefore that gives you omega of x power one over ten minus epsilon. Either way, I get. I just say that there are either there are complex zeros to the right of one over ten, or there are no complex zeros to the right of one over ten. And if there are complex zeros to the right of one over ten, then use Landau, because we have seen that whenever you have a complex zero, I get an omega result. Therefore, that will give you omega of x power one by ten minus epsilon, which is what I want. But on the other hand, if there are no complex zeros, 
then of course i can use this method because i can move up to 1 over 10 since i can move up to 1 over 10 i can use this method that's exactly the idea that if zero is a has complex zeros in sigma bigger than 1 over 10 use this method if not use that but this can theoretically be done but on the other hand it gives you some sort of some complications okay but can be done I means not that it cannot be done but ramchandra came up with a beautiful idea which is precisely what i want to explain and this beautiful idea which i will first of all state in some sort of an imprecise form and then i will make it pretty clear what ramchandra puru is that what is it i want i want to prove What is the one? Yeah, yeah. What's that? I want. I I want to prove this theorem. Okay, but I don't want this equality or any such nonsense. What I want is just to say that somehow if the right hand side is infinity, then the left hand side is infinity. That's all what I am using. I am not using that these two sides are equal or anything like that. I am only using the fact that if I choose my alpha in such a way that the right hand side is infinity, then the left hand side is infinity, that gives you omega s. And what, now what Ramachandra says is if that is all the conclusion that you want, that if the right hand side is infinity, the left hand side is infinity, then that conclusion holds even if the number of singularities of f of s in sigma bigger than 1 over 10 up to height t is o of t power 1 minus epsilon. Okay, therefore, even if there are singularities, you need not really bother. You can still move the line of integration and you can still use the growth function. There's no problem at all. Therefore, you need not really say that, okay, if there is a complex zeros, then I will use uh, Lando. If there are no complex zeros, then I will use this method. Nothing at all. Even if there are complex zeros, even if there are singularities, how does it really matter? You can still do that, provided the number of singularities is essentially little o of t. Therefore, that's what exactly what I'm saying. It is a, if the number of singularities is o of t power 0.99, we can still do that. And in our case, in our case, the number of singularities of zeta 6x in six, sigma bigger than 1 over 10, which is same as saying that the number of singular zeros of zeta s in sigma bigger than 0.6, is small because of the density result. Density result says that n alpha t is less than t power 2.4 into 1 minus alpha plus epsilon. My alpha is bigger than 0.6, therefore 1 minus alpha is point less than 0 0.4. 2.4 2 times 0.4 is 0.96. And therefore I get a bound which is t power 0.96 plus epsilon. And therefore consequently, I can apply Ramachandra's theorem. And therefore I can move the line of Therefore, I, it's not necessary for me to discuss two separate cases of whether uh, there is a complex of, uh, zero or non complex zeros, nothing at all. And one more thing important, which is exactly what I'll be talking somewhat detailed later. One more thing which is important is Ramachandra talks about only about the number of singularities, not necessarily about the number of polar singularities. Therefore, even if your function has a certain logarithmic singularity, even then, then you see, you can't apply the land of theorem or anything like that, the growth functions. Therefore, now, even if there's a logarithmic singularity, it doesn't really matter, you can still use this. That is the theorem, which is what I want. And since I have 10 minutes, uh, I will just state one theorem and prove that and then we will probably close that and uh, i don't know how many of because the, the idea okay uh, i don't know how many of you know really the fact that riemann hypothesis implied love hypothesis of course i will not be needing this result but on the other hand i will be needing the ideas behind the proof of this result and therefore i would like to explain this result and then can do I probably can do it tomorrow. I think people might be a little tired already.
No, sir. It's not very big one. Ready? So we can do this theorem and then we can stop. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Therefore, what I want to do is to prove this theorem. U one hypothesis implies law of hypothesis, which essentially means that I am assuming that uh, uh, Riemann hypothesis, which means there are no zeros to the right of half, and then I am going to prove Lindner hypothesis, which is zeta of sigma plus it is of t power epsilon for sigma bigger than equal to half. For technical reasons, let me put it prove it for sigma bigger than point five four. The same argument would work. The idea is something like the following. I take four circles and all concentric circles, one with the two plus it, and the first circle has a c1 has a radius which is one point four nine, c2 has a radius which is one point four eight, and c3 has a radius which is one point four seven, and c4 has a radius point five. Therefore, I have three circles, four circles of the different radius, all concentrated with the center at two plus it. The first thing which you have to observe is. The function logarithm of zeta s is well defined in this region because there are no zeros and log zeta s I can define on the real line and I can do the analytic continuation there. On the real line, of course, I can define log zeta s as a uh, real number because zeta s is real on the real line and then I can actually move it to and uh, do the analytic continuation. And now, what do I know? I already know something like. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Hardy's first approximation theorem. Hardy's first approximation theorem tells you that the zeta function can be uh, truncated at n less than or equal to t, and consequently, zeta function at any sigma is bounded by t power 1 minus sigma. I actually don't even need that. I just need a weaker result. Zeta function is O of t power 1 over 10. Okay. Now, once you have a bound for the zeta of mod zeta s is O of t power 10, I can take the real part of the GS. Yeah, GS is by definition logarithm of zeta s, and the real part of GS is a log logarithm of mod zeta s, and mod zeta s is O of t power 10, and therefore this is less than 10 log t. Therefore, the real part of GS is less than 10 log t. And here, for those people who might not have seen this moral Karatsadiri theorem, which I am going to use, let me make it something very clear. Namely, I am getting only a one sided estimate for real GS. I am not getting a bound for the modulus of real GS. Because in order to get a bound for the modulus of real GS, I should say not only that zeta of s is not big, I should also say zeta function is not too small. The only assumption which I have made so far is that zeta function is not equal to zero. But the zeta function may not be zero, but there is absolutely no reason why it cannot be very, 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 very small. If it is very, very, very small, then the logarithm of mod zeta s will be negatively very, very large. And logarithm of mod zeta s will be negatively very, very large, which means that I do not have a bound for the modulus of real part of zeta s. This is very important. I have only a one sided bound, and the one sided bound is the only thing which I can get. There is no way I can get a bound for the, the two sided bound for the real part of GFS. The two for in order to get the two sided bound for the real part of GFS, I need the information that zeta s is not only not too big. But I also need the information zeta s is not too small. The very fact that I know that zeta s is not equal to zero is not sufficient for me because zeta s may not be zero but still can be too, too small so that the log mod zeta s actually becomes the real part actually becomes uh, negatively large. That's, that's a warning. Right? This is a warning for those people who might not have seen the so called moral character inequality earlier. Therefore, I am not claiming this. Now there's a moral Karatri inequality. Moral Karatri inequality says, oh, I should have the one-sided bound on the real part of a big circle. Okay, I'll make the thing a little later carefully. But we have one-sided bound for the real part on a big circle C1 gives a bound for the absolute value of the function on C. Yeah, this model. This is all exactly what the Burrell character is. That if you have a one-sided bound for the real part on a big circle, 
then you have a bound for the absolute value on a slightly smaller size. And that you use, then you will get not only mod real part of GS is O of log T, mod GS itself is O of log T. Okay. Therefore, on the circle C3, mod G of S is O of log T. On the other hand, look at the circle C4. The circle C4 has a radius 0.5 and the center at 2 plus i t, which means that this circle C4 lies completely to the right of 1. Since the circle lies completely to the right of 1, the function GS is bounded. Therefore, on C4, the function is bounded, and on C2, the function is bounded by log t. And now, now once you have three circles, so C2, C3, and C4, and on C2, it is bounded by log t, and on C4, it is bounded by 1, then there is something called the three circle theorem, which says that on C3, you can bound it. Three circle theorem says that if you take MR to be a maximum of G of S in mod S minus 2 plus IT R, that is, therefore, MR is the maximum of a function on a circle of radius R around the point 2 plus IT, then this log MR is a convex function of log. Okay. And in fact, in the same case, of course, if you don't want to use three circle theorem, you want to use Frankman and Lindelof also, it can be equally done. Okay, therefore, I will leave it as an exercise that at this stage, not using three circle theorem and using Frankman and Lindelof because what all you are interested in is finally convexity. Okay, but anyway, since I have explained to Frankman and Lindelof in detail, let me do the three circle theorem. Therefore, log MR is a corner function of log R. This by definition means that if R1 and R, the, the three circles are R2, radius R2, R3, and R4, and uh, R3 is the mid circle, then logarithm of MR3 is less than or equal to logarithm of MR2 into log R3 minus log R4 by log R2 minus log R4 plus logarithm of MR4 into log R2 minus log R3 by log R2 minus log R4. This is exactly what. Now you know the value of R2, R3, R4, etc. Substitute it. Okay. Remember what is MR? MR is the maximum of the function. Outside this function, the maximum is log t. Therefore, log MR is log log t. For the outside circle, log MR is log log t. For the inside circle, log MR is 1. And substitute it, then the log log t, you can say a little. Log MR3 is less than 0.99 log log t. Therefore, by convexity, the bound log log t can be saved to a little by 0.99 log log t. And that is good enough for us because then MR3 is order of log t power 0.9. Therefore, mod GS is of the order log t power 0.99. Therefore, the real part of GS is of the same order log t power 0.99. But the real part of GS is mod log, log mod zeta s. Log mod zeta s is of the order log t power 0.99, which means that zeta s is equal to O of exponential constant times log t power 0.99. But exponential constant times log t power 0.99 is O of t power epsilon. And that's exactly what I want to do. Therefore, I take circle, first I take a big circle, and in which I say the logarithm is well defined, and then I get a bound for the real part, one sided bound. And then I use parallel color theory that gives you a bound for the absolute value inside the small circle. And I take two more circles, and then it is the three circle theorem will tell you that the log of my is a convex function of log of. Therefore, inside is still a smaller circle. I save a constant instead of one, I get 0.99, and that is already good enough for me. I just make two remarks. The proof goes through even if you assume that it's a local, the whole thing say. That around t, if I want to prove over a distance of log t, if there are no zeros, then I improve because I am using only these three circles. And more, I just got real part of GS, but I can also get the minus real part of GS. And the real part, because I have bound for mod GS, since mod GS bound will give you not only real part, minus real part of GS, also of log t power 0.99. Right? That gives you actually 1 over zeta is also of t power. Therefore, given this, earlier I was saying 
that this function can be, I am only assuming it's non-zero, can be too small. But now this idea shows that it cannot be too small at all. It is always bigger than t power minus epsilon. And with that, we'll stop. Thank you, sir, for such nice lecture. So do you have any questions? So, <clears throat> I am seeing um, Sankar sir unmuting himself. So. Sankar no sir, question. You... No question. Oh. Okay. <laughs> there is question in there, the chat. There is something in chat box. Just check. Saurav? Yes, sir. So there, there, are, there are two in chat box. Yeah, exactly. What are they? Who is it? What is the little of T in Ramachandra statement? What are zeros? Okay. I, otherwise, the, the proof doesn't work. I mean, the, the, the point is, okay, I, when I explain the proof, you will understand. The point essentially is that he moves a line of integration only where there are no singularities. And then, even then, he says that the the measure of the the measure of the line on the one tenth line is bigger than constant times t. Otherwise, if there are singularities everywhere, sort of, you cannot even move the line of integration. You won't do anything with that to one over ten at all. Therefore, you cannot. Yeah. Therefore, the singularities are allowed, but not too many singularities are allowed. Convergence. Is it clear, Shankar? Is it the same? No, Shankar? Uh, sir, there is one more question. Yeah. <clears throat> that, uh, I, have, I don't see it there. In the chat, sir? No, convergence problem, but no, no, the proof doesn't work simply. It will be clear that the proof still does not work. Okay, yeah, just for more possible. Oh, just thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, sir, any any more questions? Uh, sir, I just want to ask that when you are writing that ex as the million transform of the function f of s. Yeah. And uh, sir. Uh, so I just missed the point. So what happened to the main terms you were saying that the main terms come from the singular? Thing? Main terms have disappeared because I have already moved the line of integration. Therefore, the EX is the uh, integral okay. on the left. So okay. that, is the, that is the main transform. Okay, okay. So, so you have already assumed that uh, you are a lift of the, uh, all the lines. Uh, that's why I said even if there are three poles, that's why you move towards, uh, you okay. cross all the poles and go to the left. Okay. If no more questions, then we will thank the speaker for such wonderful lectures. Okay, then we will have a five minute break and we